In Psalms 77, beginning in verse 1, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. Selah. Thou holdest mine eyes waking, and I am so troubled that I cannot speak. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with mine own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. And I said, this is my infirmity. But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also all of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? Thou art the God that doest wonders. Thou hast declared, declared thy strength among the people. and Thou hast with thine arm redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. Selah. The words, the waters saw thee, O God. The waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths also were troubled. The clouds poured out water. The skies sent out a sound. Thine arrows also went abroad. The voice of thy thunder was in heaven. The lightnings lightened the world. The earth trembled and shook. Thy way is in the sea and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Thou lettest thy people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. We're going to stop there in verse number 20. I want to call your attention tonight back to verse 19. And then we're going to look at several of these verses together. And verse 19, he said, Thy way is in the sea, and thy path in the great waters, and thy footsteps are not known. Now I want to preach tonight on when his steps are not known. I think every one of us have been there at some time or other. I preached, uh, I don't know that you remember it. Sometimes people don't remember from one Sunday to the next uh, what the preacher preached on. And, uh, but I preached a couple of years ago, I believe it was the Jubilee 88 over at Morning View. And I preached this message, or preached part of this message in about 20 minutes over there that night. And uh, they, that's what they allot the speakers 20 minutes, and so I preached it in about 20 minutes. And I'm going to try to give you about a 40-minute version of it tonight and see some things that we didn't preach that night. And uh, you don't have any place to go. It's raining outside, and, and uh, you don't have to be at work until in the morning, so we might as well just dig in here for a while and get something that will help us. And uh, that way you'll feel good in the morning whether the sun shines or whether it don't. Amen. Aren't you glad that, that our salvation... Our relationship with the Lord does not depend upon the circumstances that we might be in. Don't have anything to do with it, does it? Here, in Psalm 77, as I said, Asaph was the choir director, choir leader, song leader, whatever name you want to call him, uh, in Israel to David, to King David. And uh, I don't know the... Many ascribe at least 12 of the Psalms uh, to him, that he authored at least 12 of the Psalms. But uh, and, and the time of Psalm 77 is not really certain as to when that this Psalm was written. But we do know this from just reading the Scripture, that it was at a time when he was going through some terrible trouble and discouragement in his life. And even, even song leaders get discouraged sometimes, just like all of us get discouraged. We're never immune. Some of us hide it better than others, 
But the truth of the matter is we're all human, we're all flesh. And there are times when we go through those times of discouragement, we go through those times that are valley times in our life. But I'm glad that God has given us some examples in the Word of God that we know there are others that have walked where we have walked. I mentioned this morning in teaching Sunday school where the Bible tells us when Peter was writing to uh, the people there concerning their suffering and persecution, and he reminded them that some of the same things had been accomplished, some of the same affliction and suffering had been accomplished in their brethren that they were going through. And all of us at times go through times of discouragement. But I want to take these verses tonight out of Psalm 77, divide them into two divisions, and center our thoughts around these two divisions of this psalm. I want us to look tonight at this, uh, at this psalmist as he falls to the very bottom of discouragement. Now, you've heard of bottoming out, and that's exactly what he did. He, I mean, he plunged all the way to the bottom of despair and discouragement. But then the second division that I want us to look at is how he faces with boldness the dilemma that he's in. Now, as he falls, there's three things that, that, that get our attention on his way to the bottom. And then there are three things that get our attention on his way back to the top. And so that's kind of the structure that I want us to look at <clears throat> in this psalm tonight. Let's look as he falls to the very bottom of discouragement and despair. Three things that he does, as I said, on the way down. First of all, he prays. Look in verse number 1. He said, I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. Now he began to pray. He began to pour out his heart unto the Lord. Now it wasn't that, you see, it wasn't so much that he was interested in the Lord hearing him. He knew from verse 1, he said, he gave ear unto me. It wasn't so much a matter that he wanted the Lord to hear him. He wanted the Lord to respond. He wanted to know that, that the Lord was not only hearing him, but he wanted to know that the Lord was going to respond to his prayer. And so we look at the prayer as he prays, he begins to pour out his heart unto the Lord. He begins to describe his time of trouble that he's going through as though the Lord didn't have any idea what was going on in his life. And so this prayer that he prays really consists of his description as he describes the trouble that he's in to the Lord. Let's look at it together. Look in verse 2. He said, In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. First of all, this prayer that he prayed as he describes his trouble, he described his problem to the Lord as persistent. He said, my sore ran into the night, or my sorrow ran into the night and ceased not. And he said, my soul refused to be comforted. Now, can you remember going through times, and you may be in, in times like that tonight. I don't know the condition of your heart. I don't know, do not know the circumstances of your life. And you may be going through a time right now when it just seems like that your time of trouble is so persistent that your sorrow even runs into the night and ceases not. And that, that your soul just refuses to be comforted. Maybe you've prayed about it. And maybe that uh, your sorrow is still there. Maybe you've shared your trouble with friends and you've talked it over with your family or friends and people you know, and yet your sorrow is still there. And nothing in prayer, nothing that you share with your friends or your family seems to bring comfort to your soul. Now that's the way he describes this time of trouble. Have you ever been there before when it just seemed like that your problem, your trouble, but just it just kept on and it was persistent? I mean, you got up in the morning, it was there. You went to bed at night and it was there. And it was just a constant nagging problem that you were contending with day in and day out, and your soul refused to be comforted. Now, it not only, as he describes it in verse 2, was it persistent, but it was also prevailing. Look in verse 3. He said, I remembered God and was troubled. 
I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. He said, why? This thing got the best of me. It prevailed over me. He said, my spirit was overwhelmed. I complained about it, and that didn't even help. You ever com- I'm sure nobody else ever complains when you get in trouble. I'm probably the only one here that ever complains about my problem sometimes. But here the psalmist said, why? I even complained. And he said, my spirit was overwhelmed. He said, this thing literally overwhelmed my spirit and got a hold of me. He lost control. I mean, he just simply lost control. It was prevailing. And then if you continue to read in verse number 4, that it was processive. I mean, it just literally uh, took a hold of him. Look in verse 4. He said, thou holdest mine eyes waking. In other words, he said, Lord, you know, I can't even sleep. I can't even sleep. And he said, I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. Now listen, that thing had, I mean, it had literally, whatever the nature of his trouble or problem was, it had literally began to possess him and to dominate his life. I mean, it ran into the night. It was there, persistent. Day in and day out, even into the night, his soul just refused to be comforted. He complained about it. His spirit was overwhelmed. And he said, now, you know, Lord, that my, you see, you behold my eyes waking. And Lord, you know that I can't even get any sleep. You ever been to the place before when you, I mean, I've, listen, I've gone to, I've gone in before and I've been so tired in body and my mind and emotions were just literally, it felt like that every ounce of strength that I had was drained. And I thought if I could just lay down on the bed, I'd be asleep just like that. And I've laid down on the bed tired and weary under the load of burdens and troubles before and my eyes just get, I just get bug-eyed and, and lay there and think about it and, and, and the more I think about it, the more it gets a hold of me and the wider awake that I get and lay there and roll and toss and, and get to the place that you can't even sleep. And then he said that I'm so troubled that I cannot speak. He said, I don't even want to talk about it. You ever been, that, you ever been to that place? When you, I mean, you didn't even want to talk to anybody. You didn't even want to see anybody. You hated for the phone to ring. You didn't want to run into anybody that you knew. You ever been that way? I mean, you, you couldn't sleep. I mean, your trouble just had a hold of you. It possessed you. You couldn't get rid of it. Well, that's the, that's the way this psalmist's trouble was in. That was the kind of trouble. And he began to pray and describe his problem to the Lord as though the Lord didn't know anything about it. And the more he prayed, the worse it got because this thing just progressively gets worse. So on his way down, first of all, he prays. Secondly, then, he begins to ponder. And look in, look in verse number 5. He said, I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. And he said, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart and my spirit made diligent search. You see, he begins to ponder about the past. I'm going to tell you something. We talk about the past a lot of times, but a lot of times the worst thing you can do is go back to the past. I mean, it don't, it don't make things better. I mean, to remember the good old days, it makes everything worse. <laughs> I mean, just it makes them worse. And here, the psalmist, he began to remember the past and he began to think about the the days of old and how it used to be and what he did wrong was he compared the days of old with his present situation. And that's the wrong thing to do. A lot of times when you remember and you begin to ponder in your mind and go back to the days of old and remember how the good old days used to be and then compare them with the present situation that you're in, it'll make you more depressed. It'll make it worse. To think about how good things used to be. Why well, I go through times of trouble sometimes and times of discouragement. And the worst thing I can do is remember how it used to be. Sometimes I, I, I get through, you know, I go through times of discouragement or, or through times of, of low places and valleys in my life. And I think about those days back when I was a kid preacher, pastor my first church. And, and I get to think about the days back then. And I thought I had problems back then. And I get to thinking about those days and comparing them with today, and I think, my, I wish I was 21 again, and I was back up there starting over. And it just makes you more depressed. 
Well, he remembers the past, and then he begins to ponder about the peace that he used to have. He said, why? In verse number 6, he said, I call to remembrance my song in the night. He said, well, I've been discouraged before. I've been through the valley before. And he said, I've spent some nights alone before. But he said, during those times, he said, I used to have a song in the night. I used to have a song. I used to enjoy peace even in the midst of the storm. He remembered those days. But he, he begins to ponder back on those things now. And it seems as though they got worse. Well, there's a third thing he does on the way down in this progression. That is, he just sinks to the, to the very bottom. First of all, he prays. And then he begins to ponder and think back. And he begins to pair the, compare the past with the present. You know where it's leading to? He's getting ready to start probing. And so he prays, he ponders, and then he begins to probe. And what I mean by that, he begins to question God. And six questions, six questions, he fires six questions, one right after another, at the Lord. Now I know... That there's not anybody here, this psalmist and me are probably the only two that's ever questioned the Lord in a time of discouragement. I want you to look at these. He said, will the Lord, in verse 7, will the Lord cast off forever? Has the Lord just rejected me? Has He just set me aside forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is the Lord never going to be favorable to me again? Is his mercy clean gone forever? He must have been a southerner the way he talked. <laughs> Is his mercy clean gone forever? He says, Does, doth his promise fail forevermore? Oh, listen, there's times when you, you go through times of despondency and you go through times of discouragement and you can latch hold of the promise of God and you can stand on His, on His promise and you can sing amazing grace right through the midst of your valley because that you latched hold and got a hold of a promise from God. But there's times when even His promises don't work. And He said, Doth His promise fail forevermore? He's, I can't even find a promise that'll work. Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Has the Lord forgotten me? Has He forgotten to be gracious? Hath He in anger shut up His tender mercies? And then that word seal just simply means, you know, to ponder these things, look over these things, give attention to all these things. And here's these questions that he throws at the Lord and he can't figure out what's going on in his life. And so he begins to probe and ask questions and, and begin to, to wonder. And, and I mean, he thinks that the promises of God are failing. God's favor is gone and, and his mercy has gone. He's in terrible shape. Have you ever been there? And some of you folks tonight... All your ducks are in a roll, so to speak. Everything's fine. You, it's hard for you to identify with this. It's hard to identify that a man can drop so low and get so low. I mean, this man must have been a, he must have been pretty close to the Lord. He must have been a pretty spiritual man. He's one of the leaders uh, in Israel. He was David's song leader. He must have been a pretty spiritual-minded person. But here he is, a leader. And he's down to the very bottom. And he's beginning to question and probe into why this and why that. And all these things. I mean, he's bottomed out. So on his way down, he prays. And then he begins to ponder and compare the past with the present. And things get worse. And then he begins to probe and question God. And ask the Lord all these questions. But there's something that takes place. The bottom line to all these questions is this. Lord, is this it? Is, is it ever going to be better? Lord, am I ever going to rise above this 
this circumstance? Am I ever going to get out of this trouble? Am I ever going to get out of this valley that I'm in? I mean, that's the bottom line to all these questions. Lord, is it ever going to be any different? Is it ever going to be any better than this? Lord, are you ever going to manifest yourself again? Are you ever going to be real to me again? And you may be asking some of the same questions tonight. So he's at the, he's at the bottom. And listen, when you get on the bottom, there's no place to go but up. No place to go but up. I mean, when you, when you get on the bottom, no place to go but up. And just remember, he's the lily of the valley. He's down there. He's with you. Underneath thee are the everlasting arms of God. So he's, he's bottomed out now. So there's no place left to go but up. How does he get up? How does he get up? He's descended now to the very lowest of the valley. And you can't get any lower until you reach the place you begin to question God. I mean, that's about as low as you get in the valley. But now he starts up. How does he get up? Look in verse 10. He faces with boldness the dilemma that he's in. You know how he gets up? And I said, he said, I said, this is my infirmity. You see, he faced it. He said, this is my infirmity. This is my weakness. And that's what this word infirmity means. This is my weakness. This is my infirmity. It's not somebody else's, but it's mine. This is my weakness. Now notice what he does. You see, they, I said there's three things he does on the way down. There's three things he does on the way back up. And the first thing he did was face the fact that it was his infirmity. It was his weakness. And he said, so this is my infirmity. Now, notice the first thing he does when he faces his own weakness. He revives his memory. And in verse number 10, he said, But I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. You say, now preacher, a few moments ago he was pondering and remembering the past and it got him in trouble. What's the difference in what he was remembering back up in verse Three, when he said, I remembered God and was troubled and so forth, and, and it just made matters worse. What is the difference in his memory going back then and going back now? Well, it was the comparison that he made. You see, he was going back in the earlier verses, and he was comparing his situation of the past. He said, I remember when I used to have a song. I remember when I. You see, he was remembering himself and how he used to be. And he was comparing the past with his present, so he just got more depressed. But you see, he's reminding, he revives his memory now, and he's going back to God. And you know what he finds when he goes back to God and compares God back there to right now? He finds they're the same. <laughs> Amen. God hadn't changed. And what he's doing when he goes back, he said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. What he, the right hand is power. Anytime you see the right hand of God mentioned in Scripture, it always is significant of God's power. And he's saying, I go back and remember the right hand of God, the Most High. I remember His power. And I'm convinced that the same power that He had back there is the same power that He has now. God hadn't changed. And so the same God that was, that was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's is my God. And you know what it does for you and I when we revive our memory and go back? We realize that the same God that parted the waters of the Red Sea, the same God that shook the walls of Jericho down, the same God that got in the lion's den with Daniel, the same God that walked in the fire with the three Hebrew children is the very same God that lives in your heart and mind. And He's available to you and I. We just need to remember that God's the same. You see, God don't change. And so that's the thing that got him started up. He revived his memory, and he said, I'll remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. 
I'll remember the works of the Lord. Surely I'll remember thy wonders of old. So he revives his memory. Secondly, he redirects his meditation. And look in verse verse, uh, number 12. He said, I will meditate also of all thy work. He said, I'm going to meditate on your work. I've been thinking about myself. And here I am bumping the bottom. But I'm going to start thinking about your work. I'm going to, I'm going to start meditating on thy work. And you know what he did? He began to think right. And what the Bible says, a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. He began to think right. And the next thing he does, he starts talking right. Amen. Are you listening? You may be down in the valley tonight, but if you'll revive your memory and recognize that God's the same, whether you're on the mountain or whether you're in the valley, if you'll redirect your meditation, get your thinking off yourself and get your thinking on God, the first thing you know, you'll start talking right. (laughs) Amen. You'll start talking right. And look what he said in verse 12. I'll meditate also of thy work and talk of thy doings. Next thing you know, you've been down in the mullet grubs. You've been down in the valley, and you've been down in the mouth and, and just talking negative talk all the time. You get up with it in the morning, go to bed with it at night. But when you revive your memory, redirect your meditation, begin to think about the things of God, the next thing you know, you're talking about what all the Lord's doing. Now, notice this. <laughs> no, notice this. I mean, here's a, here's a transformation that takes place. He said, I'll meditate also of all thy work, and I'll talk of thy doings. Now, is this the same fellow that, that fired six questions at the Lord just moments earlier as though God wasn't doing anything? <laughs> he didn't have anything to talk about. I mean, he, he was talking about what all God wasn't doing back up here on the way to the bottom. But on the way to the top, he's talking about... And listen, circumstance, circumstances hadn't changed. His valley's still the same. Circumstances around him were the same on the way up as they, were, as they were on the way down. He said, well, preacher, what changed? He did. <laughs> Amen. And the key to it all was when he said, this is my infirmity. This is my weakness. He faced his dilemma with boldness. He revived his memory, redirected his meditation, got to thinking about the things of God. And the next thing you know, he is on his way to the mountaintop talking about what all God was doing You know what God can do for you tonight? If you'd revive your memory and redirect your meditation, the next thing you know, you get up in the morning and talk about what all God's doing. And I mean, you you, might have come in this place tonight on the very bottom like like this psalmist. Asking questions, well, what's God doing? Why isn't God doing this anymore? And why isn't God doing that anymore? But you could leave here tonight and talk about the things that God's doing and not a thing other than you. That's what happened to this psalmist. He said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember. I'll revive my memory. I'll redirect my meditation. Now notice something else that happens. When he redirects his meditation, he begins to think right. It results in him beginning to talk right. He begins to talk of of thy doings. And then in verse 13, he recognizes the Lord's might. And in verse 13, he said, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. He said, Your way, Lord, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? He says, Why? He's a powerful God. Who can compare to him? Now he, he's, he, a few minutes ago, he's talking about what all God wasn't doing. He's saying, now, who can compare to God? He said, well, nobody, nobody has a God that can compare to the God. Who can compare to him? He's beyond compare. He, I mean, he's so, he's so powerful that none can compare to him. He's a powerful God. But here's the greatest blessing In verse 14, as he recognizes the Lord's might, in verse 14, he said, Thou art the God that doest wonders. Present tense. Present tense. Thou art the God that doest wonders. You know what he comes to the conclusion? 
He's remembering about all the past and all of that and just got further down and further down. But when he began to revive his memory and redirect his meditation, he began to recognize the Lord's might. And he said, why, the Lord is a powerful God. But better than that, he's a present God. He's, he is what he does right now. He doeth wonders right now. I want to tell you something. The greatest blessing that you can get a hold of tonight is you're here and maybe you're in the valley. The greatest truth you can get a hold of tonight is to recognize that God is still a present tense God. He's not a God of the past or a God of the future, but he's a present tense God. And he's your God if you know him as your Savior tonight. Three things he does on the way to the bottom as he falls to the very depths of discouragement. He prays, he ponders, and then he begins to probe. And he gets so low that he questions God. But on the way up, he said, this is my infirmity. This is my weakness. And he revives his memory. He redirects his meditation, begins to think about the things of God. And the next thing you know, he's talking right. And then he recognizes the Lord's might. And he says, why, God's a powerful God. None can compare to him. None can compare to him. And he said, why, he's a present tense God. He said, he's a God that that dust wonders right now. He's still a wonder-working God. Do you know tonight that the God you serve is still a wonder-working God? You may be in the depths of the valley, in the depths of despair tonight, but God is still a present tense God in your situation. I trust that you'll take these simple thoughts from this psalm. And if if you're in a situation similar to this psalmist tonight, that you'll apply it to your life and you'll leave here on the way up out of that valley of discouragement. While every head's bowed and every eye closed. When I went to bed last night, I thought I'd be preaching tonight on walking in agreement with the Lord. How can two walk together except they be agreed? I come back from eating lunch today and opened up my Bible and I was looking for something else. And I come across Psalm 77. And I began to read it. And the more I read it, the more it got a hold of me. I thought, I've preached on that before. I went and got my notebook down and, and, and got the date of it and looked it up. And the more I looked at it, the more it got a hold of my heart. And God wanted me to share it tonight. I don't know who that I've shared it to tonight, who, who it is, who you might be that's in the valley tonight that needs this example of this psalmist on how to get up when his steps are not known. But these principles will work in your life tonight if you'll apply them. I wonder if there might be people here just before I pray, say, Preacher, yes, I w I'm in that valley. I've been in that valley. That message God's directed my heart tonight. Please pray for me that I could get up out of this valley of despair that I've been in, in that I've been in and take these principles of the Word of God and apply them to my life. Are you here tonight in that condition? Just slip up a hand, just say by that lifted hand, preacher, pray for me. God bless you. Anyone else? God bless you. 